Good afternoon, everybody. This is Timothy Chemo Bryan, and you are on Chemo's Den of Iniquity. And I just want to thank uh, DJ Vulture again for that wonderful bump in and bump out music that, uh, well, you haven't heard the bump out music yet, so that could be crap. But the bump in music, fantastic as always, DJ Vulture. And remember, folks, we're setting up a Patreon account for DJ Vulture because he's uh, he's moved from the bathtub, and we've got him a full, uh, fold-out futon. I got an extra special guest because it's an extra special episode. So, folks, just for uh, just for uh, the sacred tradition here, a lot of times I talk to people that I've known for 20, 25 years. The longest person I've had on here so far, I've known for 27 years. This person can't say 20 years. And there was a little bit of time in between that... Uh, we, uh, we didn't talk, not because we were mad at each other or anything like that, not because the fact that I owe him $17,312.18, but just simply for the fact that we moved across the country from each other, and that's okay. I'd like to introduce you to my wonderful guest here. His name is Kurt Cabot. Kurt, are you here with us here this evening? Uh, yes, I am, Kimo. How's it going? It is fantastic, Kurt. Um, as everyone knows, my uh, voice is uh, a little bit gravelly. It's getting better. It's getting better. It has nothing to do with them wrapping my uh, vocal cords around my ankle. Um, but it is getting a little bit better here. And Kurt, your voice sounds fantastic. Where are you talking to us from tonight? I'm actually in uh, New Orleans right now. Oh, my God, folks. He's in New Orleans. Watch out for him. Watch out for him. Nothing crazy going on down there, right? Uh, no, just crappy weather right now. Yeah, that's what happens. That's what happens. And if I know Kurt, he's not down on Bourbon Street. He's uh, he's probably uh, curled up someplace near a jazz bar. Uh, well, actually, I, the other uh, day I just uh, got back from Frenchman Street. Right now I'm uh, just sipping some bourbon, actually. <laughs> well, that's what you got to do when you're in New Orleans. I'm just saying. Yeah. And if I remember right, they uh, they had a big football game there today. Didn't they? they did. They did. did. Didn't they win or something? Yeah, they did. Oh, and you know when they win, too, because there's a party going on pretty much anywhere. There you are. It's New Orleans, so it's pretty much a party all the time, but especially when the Saints win, there you go. Oh, especially. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, they got a holiday for everything. It's awesome. There we go. There we go. Now, Kurt, we've known each other, like I said, for a long time. We had a little time where we didn't talk to each other, uh, and you've forgiven that m- amount of money that I owe you, I owe you right? Yeah, I mean the seventeen thousand. Yeah, no, don't worry about it. Okay, and we won't talk about why I owe you the seventeen thousand, correct? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. It's got <laughs> nothing to do with transvestite Thursdays. Okay, it has nothing to do with that at all. Okay, or videotape, or videotape. That's for sure. <laughs> and Kurt should have enough videotape on me because I know Kurt from my days uh, at uh, VCU uh, back in the early 2000s down there in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I was a, a grad student down there, and Kurt was one of my uh, one of my uh, very promising students. Uh, you were in my uh, shop class, and yep. were you in my intro to uh, drama class too? Yes, I was in both. Okay, oh, so he got the double barrel effect there, folks. I did, and I got him in the same year, so I got him knocked out. That was nice. <laughs> so you only had to deal with me for one year, and and, and bless him for that. Uh, oh, we still hung out after that, though. Absolutely. So that was, yeah. Well, we had to. We had to because you had those videotapes on me, and I was over 21 <laughs> at the time. Absolutely. <laughs> you posted the party, pal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. I showed up with the video camera. <laughs> that was the uh, come as your uh, favorite porn star party, I do believe. Oh yes, that was, and I, I showed up in the the football jersey as a uh, Hugh Hugh Rection. That that was me. Yeah, there I remember. <laughs> <laughs> too sweet, too sweet. Well, folks, those uh, those were those days are long gone. As as you can tell, Kurt is uh, sitting in New Orleans. You know, having has uh, having some. Adult beverage, sitting back, mm-hmm. enjoying his life. Um, I, married man. Yeah, he's a married man. I'm married with kids myself, and uh, mm-hmm. and we've matured. We've aged like a fine whiskey, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely, bro. Absolutely. There we go. So, Kurt, uh, started off in theater. Before I met you in college, uh, were you doing theater? Because I know for myself, I was doing theater in high school, all four years of high school for myself. How about you? Theater in high school? Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, that's how I got my scholarship to VCU. 
Um, I went through the governor's school at, uh, at VCU and, and um, from high school, from my sophomore year. And then they said they would accept me for a, a scholarship. And I got a couple grand to show up and be a theater major there. Good deal. Good deal. Yeah. So we're starting off with theater. Um, anything else at that time that you were into? Any painting? Any uh, musician? Being a musician? Anything else going on besides theater? I, I dabbled in everything, really. Um, from, I mean, since I was, I would say, five years old is when I started singing. I, I loved to sing ever since I was five. Um, but from there, I, I did acting. I, I went through theater up into uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, actually, Albemarle Children's Theater. And then from singing to acting to, you know, Broadway type shows. And then I did a little bit of painting um, in high school. I had a couple classes in that and actually piqued my interest. So I stepped aside and I watched a couple Bob Ross episodes, I guess you could say. And then I tried to do something with that, but didn't go too far. But yeah, I've dabbled in a little bit of everything. And I've also, I played quite a few instruments. I was in band from, uh, I would say, 10 years old until I was 21. Nice, nice. So you bring up Bob Ross. Uh, I've had a, a good podcasting friend of mine, uh, Kyle Bondo from uh, Merchants of Dirt, um, mm-hmm. where he gets dirty a lot. It's a great podcast. Everyone should listen to it. Um, it's all about uh, uh, outdoor racing and all that kind of jazz. Um, I'm not into all the outdoor racing stuff, but um, but he's now uh, deemed me or uh, he's dubbed me the Bob Ross of the podcasting world. Oh really? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I'm just—I don't see it. I mean, you know, I don't have an afro. You know, I have a shaved head because I have male pattern baldness, um, in the extreme. But yeah, I'm—I'm yeah, I'm supposedly now the Bob Ross of podcasting. So I'm glad you brought that up. And and I know my wife has a, a Bob Ross uh, paint set for me in the uh, in the uh, in the man cave waiting for Christmas. Oh, absolutely. And you do have a smooth voice too. I mean, aside from this voice, your voice is very smooth, and I can definitely see some. Bob Ross uh, likeliness to it, you know, beat the devil out of it and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, oh, I definitely see it. Well, yeah, that's what I do. And, you know, when I was teaching uh, classes, I was uh, trying to make sure that everyone was as calm, as relaxed as I was uh, standing up in front of, oh, I don't know, 50, 70, uh, 18 year olds that didn't want to be there. Um, oh, and then, and then, we- and then the <laughs> three like yourself that did want to be there. Yeah. No, we wanted to be there for sure. No, and I mean that talk though. You weren't Bob Ross back then. You were more of a, you, you were kind of a mix. You were more drill instructor ish. Uh, you were more projected with your voice actually, so it wasn't as soft and smooth as it is now. I guess you could say. It's it's mellowed like a fine whiskey. There we go. Absolutely. You know what? I need to have a glass of whiskey sitting in front of me here, drinking with you. We we, we just I just need to, that's it. We're just gonna go get me a glass of whiskey. Awesome. <laughs> any, recommend, any recommendations for whiskey oh uh, yeah I mean um, whiskey is just a whew. <laughs> uh, do you have a recommendation I could tell you uh, there's a nice uh, scotch out there which is called Oban and it's an 18 year which will uh, stay smooth until the ice melts into it and the water just absorbs I mean it's Oban's a very good whiskey for me there we go, folks. You, you heard it here first uh, from Kirk Abbott here. You want to go with Oban on the whiskey side of things or, or on the scotch side of things. See, that's the thing. I don't know the difference between whiskey and scotch. I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant of that. I know my rums. I know my wines. I know my vodkas. Uh, mm-hmm. But the whole scotch whiskey thing, I, uh, I know myself, I get very, um, very angry on whiskey. It doesn't relax me. It just makes me want to beat up the Pope. Oh, and actually, Jameson does that for me. The Irish whiskey makes me want to be a pope and cry at the same time. There you go. And I used to drink uh, Sailor uh, Jerry uh, for a while. Oh, uh, Sailor Jerry. Amazing rum. That's an amazing rum. I, I do drink that from time to time still. There you go. And I mean, it's it's got a good kick and it's got a good bite. But uh, what does all this have to do with art? <laughs> hey, drinking? That is an art. Are you kidding me? Learning how to hold your booze? That's art. That is an art that is uh, best taught by uh, people in college. Or the military. Or the military, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, speaking about military, I have an Air Force background. You knew I was going to bring that up. 
because yep. you have a Navy background, and a lot of people would uh, would go, okay, uh, my Air Force guy, okay, I can see those guys being a little bit artsy fartsy because they're a bunch of pantsy waste and da 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 da. da. Um, I'm going to say it for you. You don't have to say it, uh, mm-hmm. but a Navy guy. Big tough guys with uh, with uh, with uh, tattoos and um, you know the whole Popeye thing, eating spinach and smoking cigars. Um, right. Art and the military. Do the two go together? Does it go well? Let me ask you this: Does it go together for you? Oh, I, absolutely. Art in the military goes well for me because, I mean, in your everyday job, you have something that you can relate to art. Your or how you dedicate yourself to art is how you dedicate yourself to a job. You know, it's just how you have to find the similarities. And for my job right now, I mean, I'm a flight engineer um, for a C-130, and just learning that pre-flight and knowing the pattern and getting your own, um, you know, like a pattern, you get your own philosophy down to your, the way you were trained. I mean, that's an art form. And people look at you, I mean, I'm supposed to be the all-knowing person of the aircraft. I'm the systems expert, you know, and I'm supposed to be, the person to tell the pilots, hey, sir, this is what this light means, or this is what this means. So it, I do relate art to the military, absolutely. And with that, I mean, with your acting background um, mm-hmm. and having to, you know, memorize a play, memorize the lines, memorize the stage directions um, mm-hmm. that come with a play. And um, we were talking in our uh, pre-show here. Um, you've done, you've been in the uh, film world, um, yep. and you got to re- you got to you got to have a great memory. To, uh, to be an actor myself I don't have, I've never had a fantastic memory it could be due to all the pot that I used to smoke um, and you know all the other stuff that I used oh, that to that could help actually <laughs> that could help I don't know I, I wouldn't know about that and I know you don't know anything about that either but um, but the uh, the uh, the good memory that you have to have for that being a C-130 mechanic myself in the Air Force and I got to say that the Navy doesn't have C-130s. They have planes that look like a C-130, but the engines are on upside down. Okay. Yeah, whatever. They're on right. <laughs> They're upside out. They're upside no, down. Those are P-3s. Those are P-3s. Okay, yeah. P-3s are upside down engines. You are, you're actually working on actual C-130s. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not, not a lot of people do know this. The Navy does have C-130s. See, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew you worked on plans. I knew you worked on a uh, C-130 kind of thing in our uh, pre-talk that we talked about. But okay. All right. So yeah. you are actually, the Navy does have C-130s, folks. You and me could have C-130 talk for a while if you want it off, off the show, obviously. Uh, absolutely. We'll do it off show. Right? And then yeah. you will make that bonus content for people that have a certain uh, clearance level, which none of my listeners have. Oh, yeah, very true. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I just did a lot of training for since I was on uh, telework. I just did a lot of uh, my uh, yearly training for uh, uh, clearance stuff and all that kind of jazz. So that's nice. why it's in yeah. the back of my head now. <laughs> yeah. So with that memory, it helps you out in your day to day job. I know it. You know, uh, with my memory um, and uh, my limited acting uh, background on film and, and on stage, um, it definitely I. I used a lot of association, a lot of word associations to help me out, and a lot of visualizations to help me out uh, from my memory and all that good stuff. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your film background. Okay. Um, so, film background, doing indie, indie, independent films, doing stuff for Hollywood, um, doing stuff uh, just on, uh, you know, like a mini cam for yourself. Well, uh, I, I did a lot of. Uh before the military, um, pretty much I only reached the film when I was at VCU. I actually, I, I don't know if you remember this guy, Justin Dre. He was a director of a film called Hitero the Peasant. And it was, uh, it, it might have made it to a blockbuster down on Broad Street, maybe. Um, but uh, it, it didn't really go many places because it was, you know, first film. And usually, as most people do their first films are just mostly experimental, see what they know. Sure. But you know, Justin, Justin made a great name for himself. He's in a couple of TV shows now. He, um, there's a show on CMT with Billy Ray Cyrus. He's one of the actors for uh, on there. Hilarious, actually. Um, but yeah, I did that in college. I also did a couple of small films here and there, but I didn't really get on... I didn't really get on any film since I joined the military, but I've been on TV a lot. Uh, you get in the military, you get... Um, I was a liaison in California. Obviously, California's you know, best place. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. You can't walk. You can't swing a dead cat and not get hit by a camera. 
Absolutely. And then, then there's a couple of positions over on our base that were PAOs or public affairs officers, and they would deal with 24, uh, Saving Grace, NCIS, a whole bunch of shows that would come on the base to do their filming. And uh, I did a lot of filming with, uh, I guess, JAG, Saving Grace, and NCIS. I was their liaison for my command. So I would be, wouldn't necessarily have many speaking roles, but I would have, I'd be in a lot. I mean, you could see me on uh, NCIS a lot, or you'd see me on a couple episodes, 24. Good deal, good deal. I actually, uh, in my day-to-day job, I'm a transition coordinator um, for mm-hmm. the Army. And um, see, whereas you deal with NCIS, the TV show, mm-hmm. I deal with the real NCIS down at Quantico. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, let, let me tell you, there's nobody down there at Quantico that looks like anybody on the TV show. Nobody. I've, I've been down there. Now it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Gibbs is actually 70 pounds heavier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, girl with the, uh, what's her face with the uh, the black pigtails and all that kind of stuff. Jada Pablo, her name's Ziva. Oh, no, no, you're talking about the, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You're, you're talking about, um, I can't remember right now. Yeah, the goth, the goth chick. I mean, we'll put goth it in the show we'll, yeah. Abby, Abby. Abby, that's it. We'll put it in the show notes, folks. Um, we'll have great pictures of Abby in the show notes, and that's all that you're going to look at in the show notes, I guarantee it. But... <laughs> Fun fact that Abby's older than she looks. Yeah, and she's a, isn't she like a vegan, vegetarian kind of gal? She is. She's like a vegan girl. And uh, she came down um, to one of our filmings, actually. Nice. And, uh, yes, it, was, it was pretty cool. The, the whole cast actually came down for one of them. And then after that, we usually just worked with Ziva, uh, Gibbs, and at the point in time, it was Denozo, Michael Weatherly. And see, folks, here's the thing um, with Kurt and his job. Okay, his job is, you know, he's a grease monkey. Well, not quite a grease monkey. A grease monkey, a flight engineer. It's not, uh, I was a grease monkey. I was, a, you know, a mechanic, so I got well, dirty all the time. You're kind of a grease monkey, though, too, right? I do. No, when we break on the road, I got to I gotta fix the plane. It's my job to fix the plane, so. Okay. All right. Yeah. Wait, you guys don't have crew chiefs to do that? No, I'm a flight engineer. I'm technically the crew chief as well. Um, oh, my so God. Yes, Jeez, we have flight engineers, so not only do we babysit the pilots, we also make sure that uh, we got to fix the plane whenever it's down. Dude, I failed you. I, I failed you as a as a as a teacher, as a mentor, as a friend. I Why would you say that? No, because I, I should have got you into the Air Force because we have crew chiefs that handle all that stuff. Our flight engineers mm-hmm. were treated like pilots. I mean, yeah, they were they were they were enlisted. But they were treated like pilots. They they never got their fingernails dirty. I never saw a flight engineer on one of my 130s have dirty fingernails. Mm-hmm. No, if, uh, if we get a prop oil line, I'm servicing that engine, man. If we get a tire change, I'm changing that tire. Well, see, and so, yes, you are a grease monkey. And with your acting background, I'm sure it gave you the chops to be a PAO. And... Um, to be able to uh, talk with these actors, because a lot of people they get starstruck. You know, you you get a, a, a actor in front of you that's you know nationally known or internationally known. And a lot of people are just going to freeze up and go blah. But you, I'm sure, you you know jibber jabbered with them, talked uh, about a bunch of stuff with them, and didn't have a real issue with that at all, right? Oh no, not at all. Now when we were working together, obviously uh, there's different situations. Like you go on USO tours and you just get to say hi to somebody right quick. I mean, you know that you get to say hi to one of your guys. Like, oh, I had no idea they were coming. You shake their hand, but you can't really talk because you wanted to say so many things. That's one thing. But if you're working with them and you know you got to work with them, you you may have two or three seconds of a stutter. But as soon as you guys just start talking, it's it's smooth sailing from there. There you go. Um, yeah. My biggest one is I met Charlton Heston in Mombasa, Kenya. I, I don't know if I... Uh, no, you didn't talk about that. You know, I, sh- I should have talked about that when I was in college with you. So I was uh, stuck in Mombasa, Kenya. Uh, well, man, stuck is a relative term. Uh, we were flying in and out of Somalia every day. But uh, we were in Mombasa, Kenya in 1992, 93. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was uh, marshalling. They told me it was like 3 in the morning. I had to marshal in a, a 1.30 coming on in. So I'm marshaling in this plane. Basically, I'm, you know, those glow-in-the-dark wands. I'm uh, directing how to bring a plane in and, um, and you know, parking it and all that kind of jazz, all right? So guy pops out, and usually it's an officer. So, you, you know, I'm enlisted. Got to salute the officer. Dun-da-dun-da-dun-da-da. Yep. 
No, it's Charlton motherfucking Heston. <laughs> That's and awesome. And he pops up to me and goes, where's the latrine? Now, okay, keep in mind, I'm Air Force. We don't have latrines in Air Force. We have restrooms. We have pissing facilities, okay? We don't have latrines. We don't dig latrines. Yeah, that's Army. But that's, that's an Army thing. But, <laughs> um, you know, even if you said, hey, where's the head? I would have known, okay, Navy head, boom, there we go. But no, he's like, where's the latrine? And I'm like, you're fucking Moses. That's <laughs> what I said to him at 3 in the morning. You're fucking Moses. Because <laughs> in my brain, I couldn't think his name is Charlton Heston. I just immediately went to Moses. Yeah. And uh, I directed him to where our uh, restroom was and our 24-hour 7-Eleven that we operated, we owned, you know, our AFI store, which is yeah. basically our 7-Eleven. And yeah. uh, I directed him to the uh, to that. And, um, you know, I go back in after we get the uh, plane knocked out. After I'm done shaking and my boots going, holy fuck, I just met Charlton Heston. And uh, I go in the AFI store and... There he is, you know, having a candy bar and a coffee. And I'm just like, hey, sir, how you doing? Da, 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 da. Welcome to Mombasa, Kenya. Nice. So that's that's my oh, my God story for the Air Force. Cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you have an oh, my God story for the Navy? I, I do. Uh, uh, let me, can you talk about it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. right. I, I kind of have two of them. One's with a, a singer and the other one's with a... And an, an actor, actually a group of actors. Um, so I don't know. It was it was a while ago um, in the desert, and it's when Boondock Saints two came out. The USO was doing a tour. I didn't really know about it. I, I was flying a lot, mm-hmm. but I land. We get back um, in our desert area where we're at, and uh, I go into the what you would call an AFI's area. We called the souk at that point in time. We we had the souk area, and there's just a big line. And I'm like, man, what's this line for? I'm like, oh, the cast and crew of the Boondock Saints is doing autographs. I'm like, what? So, I mean, I'm tired. But, like, I just got done with, like, a 24-hour turnover pretty much, and I'm, I'm beat. I'm tired. But I'm like, I'll stay in line for that. And so we stayed in line. And then, uh, I mean, I got a picture, too. It was funny. But we stayed in line, and I started walking through, and I met, you know, Troy Duffy, you know, director. I'm like, man, oh, yeah. pleasure to meet you. You made some good art here. Uh, I appreciate everything you do. Can you sign my paperwork? Yeah, a lot of it. And I was like, in my head, I was saying so many good things, but I probably just went blah, 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 or whatever. <laughs> yep. But, and, they, and, and what was cool about, you know, the USO over there is they gave you the pictures of all the guys and they would just sign them. But uh, I ended up running. So I saw the line. They said, yeah, Boondock Saints. So I ended up running over to the next and seeing if they had a copy of the Boondock Saints. And I just grabbed a copy of that Boondock Saints. Nice. <laughs> Came down. Pay, paid the fifteen ninety nine for it. Ran downstairs, and yeah, came with that. But then I ran into Sean Patrick Flannery and Norman Reedus. Both of them were there. Holy shit! Not bad. Yeah. So I'm I'm standing between two of them, and you know, uh, Sean Patrick Flannery's on my right, Norman Reedus on my left. I'm like, man, if only like we did one of these pictures to where like I'm one of that Italian mob guys, and like you both had your pistols to my head right now. That'd be a picture worth a thousand words. And that's all. <laughs> thinking of mm-hmm. you like making a picture for my friends at home but then like they're talking to me and i'm not hearing anything they're like who do i make this out to i'm like oh sorry i'm tired man i just got done and i had i pulled the whole little oh, I'm military man i just got done with a flight i'm tired like i ah, don't worry about it but then we started talking and uh, sean patrick Flannery was conducting uh jujitsu class upstairs nobody knew i don't know if you guys know this but he is a jujitsu gold medalist and he was teaching jujitsu upstairs to the marines a little bit later so the oh my god story in a nutshell was taught jujitsu upstairs. I end up showing up um, in my Navy PT gear with a whole bunch of Marines, and I'm the only Navy guy surrounded by Marines. Oh, that's always a bad thing. Yeah, it's, it's a big bad thing. So I'm all getting picked on and crap. But then you know, Sean Patrick Fanner comes in, and this guy's five seven, you know, five six, shorter shorter than me, and uh, he uh, teaches us jujitsu. It's a great thing, and then I get my butt kick a little bit i don't know if i can cuss on the show absolutely no no cussing and swearing is allowed absolutely all right so my ass if you will (laughs) so i I got my ass handed to me a little bit and i stepped inside and then i'm just bsing with norman reedus and he was telling me about his show that he's got coming up and this is before anything he's like oh yeah i'm just doing this uh show that i just got picked up and it's got zombies in it and everything yada yada Mm -hmm. and uh it's coming out soon so uh just look out for that i'm like all right cool and we were him talking and 
uh, we ended up shooting the crap. And then there was another side actor who was Boondock Saints. I mean, I'm chilling with all these Boondock Saints guys. And that, that was my, oh my God moment, uh, moment. But in a nutshell, like what came down to that was, I don't know, two years later, I ended up seeing this little, uh, I came back to the same area and my friend was watching this show called The Walking Dead. And he's like, you got to watch this, man. It's only six episodes. It's the first season, but you got to watch it. And then sure shit, I see Norman Reedus on there. And I'm like, that's the show he was talking about two years ago. Oh, I just, nice. yeah, it was like, holy crap. So that's an oh my God moment. Another oh my God moment is running into Toby Keith at three in the morning and then him coming playing beer pong with us because he couldn't sleep. But that, <laughs> nice. you know, yeah, that, that's, that's a different, yeah, I guess different story for a different time. There we go. That'll yeah. be for the uh, special subscribers that uh, pay you and me a whole lot of money. Oh, absolutely. That'd be nice. <laughs> and remember, folks, we've got that Patreon account for uh, DJ Vulture, uh, so that way he can get an actual fold-out bed. We're actually going to be funneling part of that money into uh, the uh, Toby Keith story, so we'll make sure that that happens for you folks. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Kurt gets uh, 40% of that money. I get 60%, so and just because it's a finder's fee. That's a deal. And I used to be his instructor in college, so you know I I, I got to make more money off of him. Yeah, yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> little yeah. little did he know. Twenty years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good deal. Well, Kurt, um, what are you doing these days in terms of your arts? Uh, how are you applying? You know the because uh, it sounds like you've learned a lot of lessons uh, in theater, uh, in music, in film. Um, and, and that whole realm. How are you applying that uh, to, today, uh, to today in your job? Well, applying arts in my job is is you know a hand in hand thing for me. Um, hey, Dad, I'm going to back you up just a second. It doesn't necessarily okay. have to be your job in your entire life. How, how are you incorporating art in your life too? Sure. Um, well, not only in my job but in my life. Um, I. I I've taken a, in this last year, I've taken a step back in terms of not really doing, I mean, I have my side projects or whatever, but now I'm actually opening my mind to appreciate different arts. So when I do travel, I look for the art somewhere and I look for, you know, things that I can find to just appreciate. I, I look to appreciate the fine things. And to me, that's a, incorporating art is just finding it in, in a nutshell. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I'm that right now, like I'm in New Orleans, like and like we were talking about Frenchman Street. Everybody talks about let's go to Bourbon Street, let's get shit faced, you know, all that good stuff. But Frenchman Street is a jazz like I, I'm like if you want to go to Mecca for jazz, I mean that's where you want to go. I mean you can take a step in any direction, drop me off at Frenchman Street, and there is guaranteed a, a band playing in twelve different bars. And and it's just nuts. I mean, you will listen to some old school stuff too. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong; they'll be playing some Thelonious Monk, or they'll be playing some Charlie Parker, but they'll also be playing their own stuff. They'll come like the New Orleans jazz, which is they'll have a little twang into it when they sing in there. And then it's just uh, looking for art is how I incorporate right now, I guess. Um, my lifestyle. Why, and that's a good thing too, because then you can go and uh, take a listen to that. Maybe get inspired. Uh, by mm-hmm. what you're listening to, and then you never know where that's going to take you. It could take you into writing a film script, painting a picture, yeah. t- taking some pictures, and you know, putting it on your cell phone, and you know, uh, years down the road, sharing it with your family. Da 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 da. Yeah, no, and, and and like I said too, like incorporating as well. When you were talking about theater memorizing, I do use the same techniques to memorize checklists for a plane, or to memorize steps in a maintenance procedure obviously read the book but you know if i have the book to my side and i want to memorize the next three steps i'll go look at it later but i use the same techniques that i did in acting and then throwing out plans doing something on the side without work i'm trying to work on my forever home and i'm doing architecture and you were teaching me you know 3d methods and i'm using that and just incorporate everything that i've learned from my past it's so easy now to do other things like hey do you know how to draw on craft paper absolutely i do <laughs> so i some people don't i don't know well yeah and it's it's kind of a dying art too because um you know yeah, yeah, yeah. just the simple uh, thing of drawing uh something even if it's just you know stick figures or something like that i had a wonderful um 
drawing class uh, in my undergrad. Um, I had a uh, teacher that uh, just came over from uh, Great Britain. Um, he was uh, on a teaching visa or some crap like that. He was big into uh, techno, a huge into techno. Oh, my God. Yeah, that This guy was just crazy. He was into some techno stuff that I'd never heard of before. And I, I like a lot of dance music, but um, yeah, he would teach the class and he would teach us to draw what we saw. You know, not what we thought we saw, but actually draw what we saw. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he would blare this techno music for an hour and a half. We met twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays for an hour and a half. And one of the lessons that he gave us is he set up this whole um, wooden chair sculpture. It was like 20 or 30 wooden chairs that he just kind of arranged and, you know, setting them on each other and looked like a piece of sculpture. And then he threw a tarp over it. And he said, draw that. And, you know, I had some people there that were, you know, fantastic artists, uh, technical artists, you know, and they were trying to draw the, uh, um, trying to draw the chairs that were under the tarps. And he was like, but you don't see those chairs. You see this tarp. Draw the tarp. And uh, that's how he taught us. He was like, draw what you see. And I still though use those techniques. And that was back in 1990, oh gosh, 98, 99. Um, I still use those techniques today. I, uh, I uh, use it when I do my oil painting. I uh, painted a uh, thing for my uh, wife last year for Christmas. Now I'm painting a thing for my girls for Christmas uh, this year. Just using the same thing, just you know, taking a photograph, draw what you see. Cool. So, yeah. And with you getting into architect, I'm just sitting there going, oh, my God, you know, I was teaching uh, basic carpentry skills on how to build a box. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and I'm not going to take credit that you're doing this architecture. But, you know, if you know how to build a basic box, you can build on that one simple skill so many different things with just knowing how to do a basic box. Sure. And you also did a, a project or two where you assigned us how to to draw a 3D model of something. And I, I can remember it to this day. I, I did a, uh, when Camel did the, the metal cartons of their cigarettes, mm -hmm. I, I took one of those out and I made a 3D model of that. And you and you guys, um, it was you and, uh, who was it, was his name Rob? Was the other guy? Oh yeah, Rob, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you, you guys were the ones who, you know, looked at it and you, you put in your input, you're like, hey, just, you know, bring this up a little bit, shade it a little bit more to the side here, and you got your 3D image. And you guys taught me a lot about 3D imaging to where I can draw that in a, in a, in a graph photo as well now because of, you know, what you guys taught me. And, yeah, in terms of building, yeah. In terms of steps and walls and helping out with, like, a house even, Habitat for Humanity, mm -hmm. yeah, you guys set the baseline for that for sure. Good deal. Good deal. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm glad that we could do that uh, and, and inspire that. And yeah, that's and that's the other thing of uh, the, of, of art, folks, is that you know, years later, um, if you've uh, listened to all 13 episodes, well, except for the first episode, because that's just me babbling for about an hour, um, which is sometimes very good. Uh, luckily, Kurt here has not heard my five-hour lighting design speech, um, but he will uh, one day. He will one day. Um, but that's the beauty of uh, getting into art is that, um, you know, years later you can inspire somebody to do something like that or influence somebody. I, I, I get, you know, a little antsy when I say the word inspire, but, you know, influence somebody, give some, you know, toss an idea to somebody or something like that. And then years later it comes back full circle and you go, hey, listen, you know, I did that because you said this. And I'm like, oh, well, I shouldn't have said that then. That's why you're in jail. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's so I'm going to give this public service announcement to everyone don't do crack folks it ain't worth it the kids ain't doing it today it ain't hip it ain't happening folks don't that, do crack that drug is so yesterday <laughs> <laughs> oh my god alright Kurt it, it's that, uh, well, actually, no, it's not that point in the show yet. No, 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 no. So we've, we've talked kind of what you're uh, doing these days. Yeah. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, you're, you're in that uh, appreciation phase. You're in that gathering that inspiration phase for yourself, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which, is a, which is a great phase to be in. Um, anything in the future that you're thinking about doing? Uh, yes, yes, and uh and 
and it's right now it feels like the I, I have it already on the back burner like I'm I put I put work into it but I'm not ready to put my full work into it like my blood sweat and tears mm-hmm. I just put little ideas left and right into into a little something to where uh, that that probably will come up later in life but um, what I really want to do has to it was kind of directing or making my own film. Okay. That would be nice. Oh, you're going to like the Satanic Seven questions then. I probably will, yeah. <laughs> Boy, do I have a question for you. Okay. So, and, and yeah, that's that's uh, what I'm working on right now. Um, obviously, you've been to the military lifestyle, and mm-hmm. it's once you're done with work, you come home. And, and right now, I'm, i got wife and kids, so it's been pretty busy. And also in college, so I really don't have much time to. I just put a little couple of ideas to the left and right here, but I don't really put my blood, sweat, and tears into it. Well, and you know, you've got so you've you've got to prioritize this stuff. But the beauty of it is, is that you still are um, out there having these ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, putting them putting them where they need to be, and then just growing on that. And eventually, you will find the time, and it will happen for you. And. Uh, if I got to go ahead and win the lottery and, you know, speed that up for you, not a problem. Done and done. I'll go play the lottery for you. That'd be nice. You do owe me 17 grand. I do owe you 17 grand. And folks, we're not talking about why I owe you 17 grand. Transvestite Thursdays has nothing to do with that. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Okay. I'm going to deny it here on, on, on the podcast. Transvestite Thursdays has nothing to do with why I owe you $17,000. Can't deny a videotape, Kimo. Oh, but I can. <laughs> it's all smoke and mirrors. I promise you, folks, it's all smoke and mirrors. See, you in Copperfield, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> all right, so we're going to hit that wonderful time here of the uh, Satanic Seven questions. Kurt, are you ready for your Satanic Seven? Uh, I guess so. Okay. Uh, let me take a drink right quick. I was going to say, why don't you go ahead and take a drink, kick up your feet, um, you know, getting that, uh, getting that recliner. Don't, uh, don't choke on your tongue while you're uh, sitting there, uh, you know, relaxing back there. So, folks, you know how this goes. I'm designed these questions. Um, there's seven questions. I was the first one to take this. I got three right and I got four wrong. Now, tell me how that happens. I designed the questions and I screw it up. It's kind of like how I used to teach my classes. I would design the test and then I would be like wait a minute that answer can't be correct and i would fuck it up and kurt is a product of those tests so mm. i'm just continuing on with that tradition okay and remember c is always a possible answer okay you can use option c if you really need to when in doubt charlie out hey charlie out there you go boss all right so not a whole lot of pressure. We've had people score perfect. We've had people go beyond perfect. Um, these questions, uh, I, I determined the points uh, through the Twitter feed, and uh, we determined, you know, if you got it right or not, you can appeal. You can appeal my decision. Okay. But you know what's going to happen when you appeal the decision. I don't. I have no idea. You have no idea? Yeah, I'm going to go tell you to go fuck yourself. I'm going to take a point away. Oh, fair enough. But okay. You, you, you do have the option to appeal if you really want to. Well, I guess I don't anymore. Well, no, you have that option. But I'm sure. just going to say, go find that's, yourself. That's and, and uh, final out. answer, no appeal. All right, there you go. How about that? <laughs> there you go. All right, so let's start off with question number one. Okay. Question number one is, what do you dislike about the art world? Okay, um... What I dislike right now about the art world is, I guess you could say, not necessarily this type of art, but the concept of it, um, minimalism. Um, mm-hmm. I I dislike the snooty, uptight artists that call stuff that they don't really have, have enough time and they just want to throw something in right quick. And, and you kind of know it when you see it. And it might be me, myself, being snooty, but I can look at a blank canvas and not call that art. I mean, there, there's a, there is art like that. I don't know if the guy, uh, is it Ryman maybe? Uh, he was the one, actually, you know, he probably was the one who painted white on white. But it's, it's the same concept, minimalism. Doing as minimal as you can and call it art. 
that's what I dislike about the art world, like poo paintings or mumble rap. Yeah, stupid, stupid stuff like that. It's you're not putting an effort in. Why well, call it art? Art is something you need to put your blood, sweat, and tears into. So that's that's what I dislike about the art world. All right, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a full point on that. Um, hey. Although, uh, I think you might be talking about Mark Rothko that does okay. the uh, the uh, you know, lines and you know like a block of color. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of like the white canvas, the blank canvas that was called art. Was that Ryman? Uh, yeah, I think that is Ryman. I, I there is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, in the Virginia Museum of Art down in Richmond. Okay. I think uh, they've got that one down there. And, they, and um, I was walking through there and I was like, oh, look, it's a blank canvas. You know, they forgot to put something on there. I was yeah. like, oh no, no! It's actually somebody just put white paint on a, you know, on a blank canvas, and I'm like, oh, what the fuck is that? I feel cheated. So, yeah, and, and that's yeah. what I kind of feel too. It's like you're not putting your effort into it, and then I don't know. There's some art today, like uh, I don't know if you saw this. A woman was making a sweater out of uh, her menstrual cycle. She was using her blood as. Uh, uh, never mind. Now that well, takes some work, man. That takes you know that takes months and months and months of work. <laughs> well, well, yeah, what females go through is like you know horrendous, and I give them props for that. But using that to your advantage to make your sweater and call it art, come on now, that's just trying to reach for extra gold there. <laughs> come on now, it's like right. me pick the booger and put it under the table. It takes me a little bit of time to produce a booger, booger art. No, you got the point. You got the point. I, I'm oh, most, I mostly agree with you. I mostly okay. agree with you. Um, and, and the big point that I agree with you on is putting your blood, sweat, and tears in it. Putting some thought into it. And, yeah. then, and then letting me know what the fuck this is. Okay. Um, sure. If it's going to be minimalism, if it's going to, you know, if it's... Break it down to me like I'm a four-year-old. Let me know what's going on here. Let me know yeah. what I'm looking at. Okay. All right. No, you got the point. I'll give that to you. Okay, you got one right. You, okay, you, you need to get so far so good. One for one. All right. You need to get two more to tie me, and then okay. three to beat me. Okay? okay. Fair enough. Now keep in mind, I'm scoring this. So. Sure, sure. <laughs> and no one, and no one has gotten lower than I got. So. Oh, that's so. Uh, well, that, prepare that, to be amazed, good sir. Oh, he's going straight for the toilet, folks. Going for gold. <laughs> Okay, uh, so question number two is going to be along the same lines as your answer to question number one. Okay. Can art be defined for everyone? And the second part of it is, should art be defined for everyone? Okay. Um, today's world, art can be defined, but at the same time, as of right now, with the politics that are going on, I don't. It, it's tough. I don't feel like a lot of things can be defined right now anymore um if we can't even define patriotism at a certain point in time without you know somebody getting in a ruck it's you know religion race gender these days but we can't define hey i'm gender neutral i'm this neutral i'm this neutral i mean how can you define art if everybody's saying you know they, they don't have their own definition for what everything everybody's opening up their own concepts i guess you could say they're making their own art with what they're doing right now but um to each their own in terms of defining an art for some person, a direct person. Hey, what you feel you're good at, pursue that, define that art. But as of right now, should it be defined for everybody? Not in this day and age. <laughs> it can't. It can't. I'm going to give you a point on that because I agree with you because there are so many, um, and this is something that I was taught a lot in um, at VCU in grad school and something that never sat right with me is you know all these different lenses with which to view art mm -hmm. um, and I mean if you really break it down to brass tacks um, there's 7 billion people on the planet so there's 7 billion lenses and you know everyone's got their own story on how they view things and if we can't have a common language on which to that we all agree on yeah. um, then it's going to be difficult to uh, define art. Now, I, I personally like, okay, so when I go see theater, and I don't know if this is the same with you or not, 
when I go see theater, I'm a horrible person to go see theater with. I'm horrible because I will I will sit there with a pen and paper and critique the lighting. I'll critique the director's choices. I will tell you what's going to happen next. If you're sitting next to me, I'll be like, okay, so this guy's going to do, and I, I don't even have to read the play. Okay. I, mean, I can just kind of go, okay, this is going to happen next. You're going to get a shaft of light over here. It's probably going to be this color because of um, the uh, the uh, the uh, costuming and da 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 da. So kind of going to see a show for me, um, mm-hmm. the magic of it, the magic of the theater is. I don't want to say it's gone, but it's something yeah. I that I struggle with. Now, when I go see a movie, and I just recently saw um, um, the uh, the Star Wars movie, uh, The Last Jedi. Don't ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it here. There's no spoilers here, but I'm just going to say that the magic of movie making I don't know how they did half the shit they did I don't know how they did three quarters of the shit they did I know intellectually I'm being uh, manipulated to look here to look there to feel this with the music to feel that with the music but that's still magical to me and I don't want I mean I've acted in film before um, mostly, you know, little, little independent films and all that kind of stuff. You're not going to see me on the big screen um, or on the TV too much, um, except for transvestite Thursdays. But mm. $17,000. <laughs> $17,000, I've got it in my head. <laughs> but when I see movies, I still have that, 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 the magic is still there for me. Okay. Um, when I go to the art gallery, um, I'm the guy that's sitting there reading the little artist statement that da 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 da, and you know the the, uh, the the history behind the painting and all that kind of jazz. And then I'll stand back and I'll look at the painting because a while ago, a long time ago, in a galaxy far far away, uh, I dated a gal that was an art uh, art history major, painting specifically, and uh, so she would give me all the stories about all these artists and all that kind of jazz, and, and would show me where to look to get the stories on the uh, piece of art and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I do, and I want to you know when I look at something. I want to get the magic first, and then I want to find out more about it. But I want to, be, you know, get hit with the magic first, and then then I want it to find later on, or I want to know the story behind it, and that helps me to find it. Sure. But you already got the point. I'm talking too much. <laughs> I'm going to give you a point and a half because I talk too much. Ah, All, right. Work. <laughs> All right. So you're at two and a half points right now. Okay. Question number three. Oh, this is a good one. What is the worst piece of advice that you followed, and what was the result? Oh. And if you okay. say, Tim, you told me a long time ago, da 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 da. No, no. No, um, it, it, I don't know if this applies to the artistic world too much, but uh, the, what comes to, head, comes to the mind is that the worst piece of advice I ever had, which has bit me in the butt the most is how to get over a relationship. So the worst advice I've ever had was get over this woman by getting on top of another one. Mm. Have you seen, uh, what is it, Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Just like that. I mean, we're talking mid-cry sometimes with some of these women. Just I couldn't get over this one woman. I tried, you know, but I'd just be a pathetic fool. I mean, that was, uh, don't get me wrong, it was a long time ago, but that was... The worst piece of advice I ever had, which I mean, it led to a from what some people would consider what I did a lot of fun. Hey, you're lucky you got to experience that. Blah blah blah. I'm just lucky I didn't come out with you know a permanent FD. You know. Yep. That that was yeah that was the worst piece of advice I got to follow. And you know, VCU had a lot of those uh, people there that were spreading around the STDs and all that good stuff. I was not one of them because I was at Transvestite Thursdays. <laughs> yeah. Where there is no STDs allowed. No, there's not. And condoms are available at the door. Hey, you know, and they're not just for balloons anymore these days, kids. I know. All there right. you go. So I'm going to give you a point on that one. So you're at three and a half. You've beaten Oops. me now. You, have, you, young grasshopper, have beaten the master. But you can still give me a negative point. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm, nope. just, I'm waiting for you to appeal. I'm just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So question number four. Oh, this is a tough one. Oh, God. This is the one that you're going to get wrong. Okay. Okay. 
if you throw yourself at the ground and miss, what are you doing and how do you continue to accomplish this seemingly impossible task? I could totally go full a-hole and like, miss? I never miss. Hold my beer. Watch this. (laughs) There's my answer. Final answer. That's your answer? Hold my beer. I never miss? Oh, 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 no. If I'm throwing myself to the ground and I I constantly miss, um, I'm keeping my eyes crossed. And uh, it's, yeah, (laughs) this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Obviously, I never miss or Uh, I can go... I'm not using my right hand and I'm not following the physics of throwing myself. And how do I complete it? I don't know. Take a physics course in college. I don't know. Okay. No, I, I can't do I'm trying to give you a point on this one. I can't do that. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. No point on that one. No point. So right. you're at three and a half, though. You're still at three and a half. No but point. I won't miss, though. That's a, that's, that's my point. I'm never going to miss that. Okay. You want me to throw myself to the ground? And miss. I want you to Go. throw yourself to the ground and miss. Oh. No. Okay. All right. Do you want to know what the answer? Yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh. If you're throwing yourself at the ground and missing, you're flying. And how do you keep on doing it? You just don't. You just don't pay attention to the fact that you're flying. Man. Which is also throwing yourself. I've only seen that movie once. That kicked me in the butt right there. Throwing myself at the ground and missing is the title of my first uh, published book of poetry as well. Oh. Kurt. Kurt. Have I'm I, sorry, man. Have I taught days you the, nothing? Days at the Village Cafe. Uh, I mean, they're, they're few and far between, man. Ah, the Village. Yeah. I'm going to give you a quarter point on that for bringing up the Village. Oh, hey, thank you. So you're at <laughs> three and three quarters points. All right. No one has ever gotten a quarter point, so you, you got the first quarter point. Ooh. Mentioning the village. Let that be a lesson to everybody else after you. You mentioned the village, you got that quarter point. Yeah. But you can only mention the village if you sat at the village with me. Absolutely. That's, that's the only way you can mention it. So if you didn't sit at the village with me, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna rub you I'm gonna rub you out on national podcast uh, radio here. All right. Promise? Absolutely, baby. All right. That's where that's where that seventeen thousand dollars is going. <laughs> All right, so we're at three and three quarters points. You got four questions knocked out. Let's do okay. question number five. All right, let's see here. He's breathing, folks. He's breathing heavy. I know these are some tough questions. All right, what is the question you are always asked that you dislike, and why do you hate that question? Um, I would say if I can go back in time would I change anything that would be the question hey if you go back in time would you change anything mm-hmm. um, first of all that could be a loaded question I mean especially if you um, if you're around certain people mm-hmm. like you go back in time like say somebody asked me that question I'm in front of my wife if I can go back in time and fix anything well you were with me back you know it's a loaded question right but at the same point in time, um, it puts you on an ongoing thought process of like how many times in the past that you just fucked up, you know, and or at least you think you did. And then it turns to a full day event where you end up, you know, you kind of question your life. <laughs> yep. Okay. You, you like you, throughout the day, you're just like, hey, man, uh, what if I do this whole fucking time? And then thankfully now I have a wife and kid who or I mean, I would probably be pretty miserable if I if I didn't have. If I didn't have a wife and kid right now, if somebody asked me that question. <laughs> gotcha. Yep. If, it, if you go back in time and change something, what would it be? I didn't have a wife and kid. I'm like, I'd probably be thinking throughout the day, eh, I peaked. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. I, I guess that'd be the question that I don't like. Okay. No, I'm going to give you the point on that. So you're at four and three quarters points. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, would you change anything? Well, the way I view it is, you know, we're here for a certain amount of time, okay? Mm-hmm. I don't have time for regret. I'm too busy living right here, right now. I mean, I got twin girls that are, you know, two floors above me. I yeah, I have not a whole lot of time to think about the future. I do here and there, but um, I try to stay right here, right now in the moment because, you know, in five minutes, 
both of them can be up and screaming their heads off and I got to get upstairs and, you know, calm them down and all that kind of jazz. Or, you know, we could get, you know, nailed by uh, the North Koreans with a nuke uh, next week. What can I do about that? Not a damn thing. Can't do anything. Yeah. And if I look back on my life, did I do a lot of fuck-ups? Yeah. But I also did a lot of cool-ass shit. And Mm -hmm. if I didn't do those fuck-ups... The thing I would regret is, did I learn from those fuck-ups? And the answer is, sitting here today, yeah, I've like you from all my fuck-ups. I have definitely learned from all my fuck-ups. Um, and I, and I want to be in that person on my deathbed who doesn't have that last thought saying, "Oh man, I wish I did this." Right. Yeah, you don't want to be that guy. No. Well, and then something that uh, that you've brought me into I, again the student teaching the master I'm not a master by any by any stretch of the imagination but um, uh, something that you brought me into is uh, a wonderful podcast and a wonderful face group uh, the Order of Man which you know I'm reading some books on that kind of stuff now and you know mm-hmm. it, a lot of the things and I also listen to Art of Manliness which is a fantastic podcast yeah I've heard about that one I'm actually going to go into that you definitely should. Everyone, you know, everyone definitely should, um, you know, check those out. You know, all the guys, you know, the women, they have their own stuff, and that's fantastic. This is for the guys, um, mm-hmm. and as, as well it should be. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, you know, teaching us how to be better men. And um, and a lot, of, a lot of what I'm seeing in there is like, you know, you need to live right here, right now in the moment. You need, you need to go and take charge of the situation. Otherwise, the situation will take charge of you. And what kind of life is that? Mm-hmm. You, know, you can always, you can be proactive or reactive. And with, yeah. the, with the job that I do, the lives that are entrusted to me, I need to be proactive. I don't have time to be reactive. So, yeah. And that, that in terms like determines the rest of your day as well, being proactive rather than reactive. I mean, that's not a really good way of leadership either. You know, you're a better leader if you're proactive. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I'm Air Force and I work for the Army because they want to hire the best. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> we'll both agree on that one. Okay. So we've got six questions knocked out. Uh, I'm sorry. We've got five questions knocked out. You're at four okay. and three quarters. The sixth question, this is the one that you're going to like. This is the one that you're going to like. I think you got this one, but this one is tricky. So. All right. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? And if possible, show your work. All right. First of all, what do you mean? An African or a European swallow? Canadian. What oh. What show do you think you're on here? Canadian, of course. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, in order to maintain an airspeed velocity, a swallow needs to be his wings 43 times every second, right? Are you, sure, right? Are you sure it's 43 and not 42? I think it's 43. Maybe 42. Uh, I'll have to go back to video on that one. <laughs> I think it's 43. Okay. Am I right? And I don't know. We can go into that. Um, so, yeah. so far, you're correct. Yeah. I, and I can't really go too much farther into that. That's as far as I remembered. But if, if you could only play the troll, and then after I asked you African or European, you're like, I don't know. Okay. And you follow up. Well, that would then, answer the question. <laughs> then I will answer. I will ask the question again, and I will play the part of the troll. Awesome. Okay. What is the airspeed of an unladen swallow? Uh, what do you mean? An African or a European swallow? Oh, I don't know that. Ah! <laughs> there you go. All right. You get the point. What the hell? What the hell? I'm feeling generous to you tonight. Oh, thank you. So you're at five and three quarters points. Yes. This is amazing. All right. La- last question. You can fuck up this question. You can well, you, you give me as many questions as you want, Kimo. I mean, I'm, I'm here. Um, I got to work tomorrow just like you, but, I mean, I'm having fun. So whatever you want to do. Well, I, I got to be up at 4 in the morning, so. All right. <laughs> I, would Fair love, enough. I would love to ask you questions all night long, unfortunately. The all right. Army, the, I do more before the Army does in, in, in 9 a.m. than the Army does all day, so. All right. Thank you, shit. <laughs> I, I, I fucked that one up, but that's okay. That's why we have editing uh, tools afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So here's question number seven. Okay. If money is no object and if time were no concern, 
if resources were unlimited, what project would you attempt? And the second part of that is, uh, with all negative factors being eliminated, would you allow this to be the only work that you are known by? So basically, I'm waving my magic wand and saying, whatever you want to do, boom, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that question is, um, that project that you're doing, is that the only thing that you're known by, or is that just one of the many things that you're known by? Go. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So this is actually <laughs> this is a big question. I actually have a lot of ideas and a lot of things that I've put to the wayward, like we talked about before. Um, one of them is uh, has to do with the uh, the the wonderful, the very talented Tom Hanks. Um, he is a big World War II movie buff, and. Uh, my project is, is I hope to, uh, I'm going to send him something or if hopefully this podcast can reach out to somebody, that'd be nice too. But I want, I want to get something to him to where I want to run by this um, movie idea for Wake Island. Now Wake Island has already, a movie has already been done, I believe in the 1940s. Um, a couple of good actors in there. Uh, Walter Abel, I think was in it. Um, but I had this book that I read. And it was written by a major Devereaux of Wake Island. I've been to Wake Island personally, so this is the reason why it got brought up. Um, we flew in there. It was beautiful. I read it, and I'm like, man, there needs to be a movie about this. And I looked up. Turns out there was, but it was the 1940s. But then everybody's remaking movies. And then I went to the World War II Museum. Tom Hanks is very in-depth in World War II. Um, I would put my time and effort into being part, not only partly directing with him, or being part of this film with the Battle of Wake Island, but to also uh, um, pretty much get in cahoots with him. And hopefully that would be one thing um, that, if I was known for that, hey, you did a Battle of Wake Island movie. All right, cool. Well, you know, Mel Gibson's known for Braveheart. All right, sweet. Uh, that probably wouldn't be the only thing I'd be known for, though. I have a couple of ridiculous ideas, like, uh, <laughs> like Shark Tank ideas. We're, we're talking like me and my friends were talking crap one day like oh send it to the shark tank here send this to the shark tank um one of them is a club idea and this has to go with architecture is breaking down the movie theater and using the theater rooms themselves as different types of clubs and like you go into one theater and it would be hip-hop one theater would be country one theater would be like an irish pub and you'd have like a whole bunch of themes in different theaters where you'd be outside where you get the popcorn usually in the, the stands and that would be your bar area. And that would be like a club called the rated R. And I already have like all the architecture trip like written out for that. Um, that's, that's our project I'm working on. Um, a stupid shark tank idea is a fitness program called spank. <laughs> that, that's a stupid one. <laughs> you know, I would, I, I so want to touch that with a 10 foot pole and I'm so scared to touch that one with a 10 foot pole. Am I, am I going to get any STDs if I touch it with a 10 foot pole? You would not, but it's just so hilarious. We were like, me and my friend are just sitting at work. My friend had this uh, fitness bar, like a spark bar or a spark energy drink. And I looked at it right quick. I'm like, does that say spank? This <laughs> is like, no, but it should. And we're like shark tank idea, fitness regimen called spank. Cause every time you get whooped, you like, every time you do your workout, you feel like you got spanked. You know, just like little things. That's, but, a, that's yeah. a great catchphrase. Yeah, every time you do this, you're gonna feel like you got spanked. You got your ass whooped. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but yeah, in terms of my no object, yeah, I would like to direct a film, and it would be a World War II um, movie. And if I can get Tom Hanks in it with me, that would be amazing. He's a guy I've respected and have followed throughout his entire career, from Joe versus the volcano to splash so like smaller films of his before he got made a big like even his family too I mean Colin Hanks is pretty famous as well now I mean he has a pretty good uh, pretty good career and uh, I mean I envy the guy in a, in a nutshell but he's my hero excellent so folks Kirk Cabot is going to come back on season number two because this will be the project that we will work on for season number two. We're going to bring Tom Hanks on here and we're going to have Kirk pitch his idea for Wake Island. Oh, if you could, that would be amazing. Now, if I can't get Tom Hanks, 
I can get the guy by the name of Tom or a guy by the last name of Hanks, and we'll get him in here, and that way Kurt can not pitch the – or we'll get two guys, one named Tom, one last name Hanks, and then boom, Kurt will pitch yeah. it. Well, for a, for a sweet settle idea too, so I've already put some of these to the side. I have a book written by the Major Devereaux it's himself, and it has the Wake Island stamp from the date I was there, and I have a Zippo that has Wake Island engraved on it that I could send to Mr. Hanks. That would be like an incentive to, hey, hear me out, you know. All right. So if anyone has connections with Tom Hanks, and I know at least one of my listeners do, because it's like that whole seven, uh, the, seven uh, the uh, separation of uh, the seven daily whoppers of Kevin Bacon. Oh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Six degrees oh, of Kevin Bacon. So Tom Hanks is, I know, in that six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So mm. well, I, we know somebody that knows somebody that knows Tom Hanks, and we can get this knocked out. Not a problem. Too easy. Yeah, we'll we'll awesome. definitely bring you on second season number two, and we'll see where we're at on that. Oh, cool. All right. Fantastic. Kurt, is there any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to uh, toss at our uh, listeners here about creating more than you consume, uh, doing art, how it impacts your life? Uh, sure. Um, don't take on too much at once. A lot of people out there, this is a new world of multitasking where you're not worth anything unless you can do five things at once. If you have a project and you really want to get it done, focus on that project. Don't don't get sidetracked. If dedicate your time, dedicate your effort, and do everything, and put your heart and soul into that one project without getting distracted by any outside any outside objects at all. That would be my only word of advice when it came to the artistic world to this day. All right, fantastic, folks. You heard it here first from Kurt. Take that project. Put your heart and soul into it. Focus on that project. Knock it out of the ballpark. Kurt, I definitely want to thank you for uh, being here with us this evening. I want to thank you for taking uh, taking out uh, some time from your busy life, uh, sharing with us some uh, wonderful uh, stories, some uh, wonderful uh, whiskey there as you're uh, kicked back and perched, ready to go down there in New Orleans. Thank you so much, Kurt. Hey, Kimo, thank you very much, brother. I appreciate it, man. Anytime. And folks, you can hear us every other Saturday at bright and early, 7 in the morning. You can get that podcast first before anybody else. Or if you're like a lot of people, uh, just go ahead and subscribe on iTunes or one of the other uh, podcast uh, um, catchers that you can uh, that you're using out there. We're on the, we're on Stitcher. We're on hey we're on the Twitter. Oh my God, I'm fucking old. We're on the Twitter. Uh, we have our Facebook page. Um, we've got Sprecher. Uh, we just added on uh, iHeartRadio. We're going to be on Spotify as well. So by the time you hear this podcast, we're going to be all over the planet, folks. So you have no excuse subscribe throw a rating on there one star five stars doesn't matter to me just makes me work that much harder for you and then we're gonna have uh, dj vulture go ahead and knock out our bump out music we'll see you in two weeks have a great time